Maureen, welcome to the Super Data Science Show. I'm so excited to have you here. We've known each other for a long time, and I've been thinking about you as a perfect podcast guest for so long. The audience is going to love you. Uh, please tell us how you're doing and where are you calling in from today? Ah, John, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be speaking to you again. I am currently in just outside of the city in northern New Jersey. The city being New York City. In Obviously, York city. that would be the city. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sounds nice. Uh, do you have some green space out there? We do. Yeah. Lucky. Yeah. I can't even remember what that was like. Um, so we've known each other for a long time. You were a very prominent member, I would say, of the deep learning study group that I ran for years, which due to the pandemic, we haven't been doing anything for well over a year now. And there was a period shortly before the pandemic where I was spending a lot of time writing a book and we didn't have many of these sessions, but we had uh, something like 16 sessions um, at a time meeting more than once a month, studying the foundations of deep learning together, which was really fun. So the whole group picked topics to study. We decide on, okay, we're going to watch this video lecture or read this chapter of a book. And it meant that it was like going to a meetup or, and those kinds of things are common, but everybody was kind of at the same level, or some people were a little bit more ahead and could explain some things to people who are a little bit more behind. And we kind of, you could have this expectation that, you know, by class 10 or <laughs> meet a uh, study group meeting 10, everybody would be on roughly the same page and you could speak at a certain level instead of starting from the basics again. Anyway, I thought that was cool. I miss doing it. I can't wait till we can do it again post pandemic. And yeah, you were, you were there from the very beginning, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. I've got to say it's was maybe my all time favorite meetup group, you know, on we started Wednesday evenings and I would leave work and then go to this very modern office in Midtown Manhattan and talk with a, a group of people that were very engaged. Everybody had looked at the materials. They all had thoughts and ideas to add. It was just a, man, it was, it was the best of, it was the best of what meetups like that could offer. So I, I hope that we have the opportunity to do that again sometime soon. I think so. I think it, it definitely. So post pandemic, once we have an office again, uh, all the offices we're looking at will have that modern feel that you mentioned and be a big open space so that we can have tons of folding chairs set up and people come into the study group again. And mentioning it now on air for the first time is this idea I have to do live podcast recordings with a live studio audience that can ask questions and clap and react during the podcast. So super, super data science listeners, uh, something to look forward to when this pandemic is over, which actually in New York, I think it's, we're going to have an office in a few months. Fantastic. Yep, yep, yep. So that'll be fun. Anyway, so we were doing that. Um, I think mostly back then when we started the deep learning study group, you were working at Enigma Technologies, which quite an enigmatic name. You can tell us a little bit about that. Uh, but now you've been working at Reonomy for coming on three years. You started as the director of data science and data engineering there, and now you're the chief data scientist. So tell us about what Reonomy does and tell us what you do there. Yeah. Reonomy is a commercial real estate company. Um, we provide property intelligence through a, a data layer, a, la a data layer that's available via uh API that provides high volume information about properties and the people and the companies that are associated with those properties, as well as the history of the property. Um, and then also through a, a website that allows you to do complex search queries and really explore and, and engage with the information that we provide. Nice. Um, yeah. And you guys are pretty big, like you're not just another commercial real estate company, you're a VC backed, machine learning driven uh, <laughs> commercial real estate company. Your most recent funding round was a series D and it's starting to get pretty meaty funding. It was 60 million, uh, six zero uh, in that most recent funding round. So big players uh, in this space. And in particular, you, you do a lot around knowledge graphs, which 
it sounds like you've been working on for a long time. So it looks like even at uh, Enigma Technologies, you were involved in this kind of knowledge graph specialization. I don't know if it extends all the way back to your PhD work. No, it does not. Mm-mm. Um, well, still many years <laughs> of knowledge graph experience. So tell us what a knowledge graph is and how that's useful, generally speaking, I guess, but then also mm-hmm. specifically at Reonomy. Yeah. So uh, a knowledge graph is very similar to uh, a social graph. If you've looked at posts or any kind of media about, for example, like Facebook's social graph and the connections between the people and this web-like structure, um, the difference between a, uh, a normal graph database, a normal uh, graph way of structuring information and a knowledge graph is that the nodes in the knowledge graph can be different types. For example, nodes in the Reonomy knowledge graph, there are person nodes, there are property nodes at multiple levels because there are kind of, there's kind of a many-to-many relationship with the property structures. And then there are, we have company nodes. Um, and focusing around those three types of nodes, we're able to capture the complex ownership structures for property within the commercial real estate space. So to go into maybe a little bit more detail about, um, let's say I focus on a person node. So the the information that we have about a person, it includes first name, last name, maybe misspellings of your name that we have in the data. It includes contact information that we have available for you. So email addresses, phone numbers, that type of information. We potentially have some demographic information linked to you. So we might know your age range. And then we also have the relationships between your node and the other nodes in the graph. So if you are present in the commercial real estate space, um, maybe you're working at a company that owns uh, commercial real estate directly or through its subsidiaries, or maybe you are the reported owner on the property. so that that kind of gives you a taste of, you know, what the relationships are within the graph and and what a node could look like within the graph. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I was actually not aware of that specific distinction of a knowledge graph relative to a regular graph. I'm going to quickly make sure that everyone knows what a node is, uh, just so mm-hmm. it's like it's obvious once you know what it is. But so in that kind of in that simple explanation of a social graph where you could think about, okay, me and all my friends. And because Maureen and I were both in the deep learning study group, there's a set of people that we both know. And so in a, in a graph representation, I could be a node, Maureen could be a node, all the people that we know, uh, and all the friends that Maureen has, and that I have that we don't know, um, I'm connected to all my friends in the graph and the things that connect nodes are called edges. And so Maureen and I would have an edge connecting us in our social graph. And Maureen would have a connection to all of her friends. She'd have an edge to all of her friends who are nodes. And um, we'd also have, to all the people that we both know from the deep learning study group, we would have, I'd have an edge connecting to that node. She'd have an edge connecting to that node. So there's, um, so not only can you have information stored in the nodes, but the connections, the edges between nodes themselves are a piece of information. Yes. Yeah, that's a beautiful explanation. yeah. And if you think to to dive in a little bit more there, if you think about the way that information is constructed, right, the, the study group itself could also be represented as a node, or we could use that information to just create a direct connection between John and I. So there are two different ways of representing that information within a graph, and there are ramifications for that information for the product, for example. Like if you wanted to understand, well, who goes to, who went to the deep learning study group, you know, you would want to have that represented as a node in your graph. And um, that wouldn't be present, right? If we were just connecting, if we were just connecting John and I using the information from the deep study group. So the knowledge graph adds this, because it has different types of nodes, it adds this extra layer of flexibility and it adds power on the product side Mm -hmm. um, that you don't necessarily have if you are just trying to skip to just trying to maintain one type of node across the graph. That's super cool. Yeah. I've never worked with knowledge graphs. They sound super interesting, super useful. So how do you, 
how do you like navigate a graph or like find what kinds of like operations can we perform on a graph to do something useful? Yeah, the way that uh, Reonomy uses the graph is to um, create ownership portfolios for commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. And the ownership structures, I call them a structure because companies in the commercial real estate space are used as financial vehicles. And what I mean by a financial vehicle is that it that it's um, essentially a container for moving money around and controlling how money is used. So uh, you will have holding companies that are formed as part of a partnership to um, just hold money that's been invested from multiple enterprise companies and distributed to um, distributed in order to uh, buy commercial real estate of certain asset type, meaning they're buying primarily retail or they're buying com primarily commercial properties or they're buying primarily some some particular asset property asset type. Another way that that companies use, the formation of other companies and create complex structures is actually to hide ownership. And one famous example of this is the purchase of the land for Walt Disney World. Oh. Well, tell so, us about it. <laughs> <laughs> so so back in the back in the 1960s, Walt Disney purchased 30,000 acres of land, um, contiguous land, meaning that the individual parcels that made up the that was 30,000 acres are all connected together. Mm -hmm. He had uh, several reasons for for hiding the fact that he was purchasing the land. There was Walt Disney. Yeah, Walt Disney. Um so uh Walt Disney land out in Southern California had been was was older and it was something that had done very well. And because of that, he wanted to expand and build another park and have it be even larger and have it be accessible to the rest of the country. And so they were looking for locations in the South where there wouldn't be, you know, frost on the rails. And so there would be, it would be easier to maintain the park. There was speculation for um, where it would be built. And the uh, Walt Disney Corporation was concerned that when they started buying land, um, other companies would buy adjacent land right. and either to develop the land and build hotels in the middle of and disrupting the Walt Disney World, or just in order to buy the land and then negotiate with the Disney Corporation and try right. to sell it back to them at a higher price. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what they did was they formed a num small shell corporations to hide the fact that it was Disney that was that was purchasing all of this land. Right. So there were kind of wild rumors about like a nuclear power plant and all kinds of things that were going on at the time. But it, they ended up, you know, purchasing the land and they did it successfully because because they were hiding who was doing it and, and what they were doing it for. Well, that story was great. I thought it was going to be some kind of crime story, though. So I thought we were going to get to have... <laughs> Walt Disney like hiding bodies or something, but all right. <laughs> no, no, everything that's done is uh, is is legal. Um, <laughs> but there, you know, there there is a, a great deal of corporations have a lot of power in the United States and a lot have a lot of flexibility for how they organize, and so they are they make sure that they are doing things to their advantage, to their competitive advantage from from a financial standpoint, and then, you know, also in situations like I described with Disney World, yeah. Nice. Well, very cool. And so basically a knowledge graph like Rionomy's allows people to speculate or maybe even know. And so in a, so if, if somebody had Rionomy in the 1960s, they might have been able to figure out what Walt Disney was doing. Yeah, yeah, they mm. would have. So we're we're very unique in that you know most of the ownership, like the true uh, highest level, the uh, ultimate parent company, is not known for for the majority of the properties across the United States. Um, so there are over fifty million parcels of land across the U.S. that fall within the commercial real estate category, and 
ownership is largely unknown. That information has been inherited from other people who work at your company there. You know, the CRE space is still has a lot of offices with file drawers and stacks and stacks of paper books. So we're really revolutionizing the, the industry by making this data available. Super cool. You may already have heard of Data Science Go, which is the conference run in California by Super Data Science. And you may also have heard of Data Science Go Virtual, the online conference we run several times per year. In order to help the Super Data Science community stay connected throughout the year, from wherever you happen to be on this wacky giant rock called planet Earth, we've now started running these virtual events every single month. You can find them at datasciencego.com slash connect. They're absolutely free. You can sign up at any time. And then once a month, we run an event where you will get to hear from a speaker, engage in a panel discussion, or an industry expert Q&A session. And critically, there are also speed networking sessions where you can meet like-minded data scientists from around the globe. This is a great way to stay up to date with industry trends, hear the latest from amazing speakers, meet peers, exchange details, and stay in touch with the community. So once again, these events run monthly. You can sign up at datasciencego.com connect. I'd love to connect with you there. Um, so are there other kinds of tools and techniques beyond knowledge graphs that have become really your specialty? Are there other kinds of tools and techniques that Rianomy makes use of? One technology that we use is we, we have high volume distributed pipelines um, and we use Spark to do that. We, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, our production pipelines are in Spark Scala. Um, we do development in, in PySpark as well though. And the, the reason that we need high volume pipelines is because we use machine learning and, and AI in order to create the edges in our graph and also to define the nodes in our graph. So mm. if I turn up on a property record um, as a recorded owner or a mortgage signator, or and I also show up on a company record, there we use AI to decide that the Maureen that shows up on a company record and the Maureen that shows up on a property record are actually the same person. Nice. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cause you've got a, yeah, it can't be just from name. There's gotta be other kind of circumstantial factors that would give your model, I guess like a, a you'd have a set of feature weights that say, okay, based mm -hmm. on the name being the same or almost the same, and uh, this, these other factors, location factors, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'm not yeah, going yeah. to speculate on your secret sauce and I'm not going to force <laughs> you to listen on exactly what your features are. But, um, but basically through that set of information, you can say, okay, there's a high probability that um, Maureen A is the same as Maureen B. Um, and then, so therefore that should be just one Maureen node and uh, that also means we're going to have to connect her to not only this set of companies over here, but also to this mm -hmm. other set of companies. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so I guess, so the reason why you need such high volume pipelines is because you have millions of data points and a graph by its nature. So if you have millions of nodes, the number of connections between nodes could be insane. Yes, And so you need these kinds of high volume tools to be able to do that processing as quickly as possible. Right. Yes. So, so in one record, um, particularly on, on the property records, you could have person names show up. We could have more than one recorded owner. Um, it could be siblings. It could be husband and wife. It could be business partners. You could also have person names show up in the seller fields or in the mortgage signatory fields. Um, so there are you know, you could have six or eight uh, person names show up per record. And then we also have, we ingest company data um, and we ingest um, uh, data that's more person centric that contains contact information, other supplementary information that we use. But we have, so we have more than uh, a billion instances of people's names coming in and we have to deduplicate all of that data 
and right. establish all of the connections from those deduplicated pieces of information to all of the other nodes in the graph. It's it's a lot. Right. It's a lot of data to process. Yeah, it's a. Um, I was just teaching a class yesterday on big O notation, like computational mm -hmm. complexity, and the task that you just described. It has polynomial time complexity. Yep. Uh, because for every new node that you add in, you might need to compare that node to every other node in the graph. So every node you add in, it's like, so if you have 50 million nodes and then you add in one more, it's not just like one more piece of information because now you need to compare that one more piece of information against the existing 50 million pieces. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, so that's very cool. I don't know, anything else? Are there other kinds of models that you need? I don't know, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm kind of stretching here now. I don't know if there would be. I mean, that sounds like already a huge amount of work that could easily consume an entire data science and engineering team. But I don't know, just giving you the chance. Is there anything else that's kind of an yeah, interesting? Yeah, we have a few models that are using, they use the fact that we have this additional context that's created by the graph. And then also the fact that we ingest property information from multiple sources. Um, we correct that the property information. So we we could get an, a property type. Um, and by property type, I mean, is this a hospital? Is this a mall? Is this an airport? Is this a... Right? We could get a property type that is defined incorrectly. And the definition, is, categorizing the properties correctly is important because that's part of how people find the properties on our website, on app.reanomy.com. If the property is undefined or not correctly defined, it won't come up when you say, you know, tell me, you know, all of the retail strips in Philadelphia, like it, it won't show up. So, um, so we have, we have a, a model that um, makes the corrections there. And um, we have another model that, so ultimately the property data comes from tax assessors and when they have a bad day, <laughs> the, the accuracy of the data goes down. And, and right. there are some counties that do much better than other counties. A unit count is like the number of offices in an office building or the number of stores in a mall. And when <laughs> sometimes you'll see unit counts that say 9999, or sometimes the right. unit count is just twice what it should be, or sometimes they'll write down five when it's 35. Um, but we can look at the other information on the property and the model can make an estimate for what the actual unit count should be. Right. And then we use that as a baseline to make corrections. So we do have models that correct data. And then lastly, we have a model that is predictive. So it, it predicts properties that are likely to sell in the next mm. uh, year or two years. Commercial real estate usually generally moves pretty slowly, much more slowly than, than, than other uh, than other objects um, that we that we uh, categorize or make predictions on with data, but yeah, and and that functionality is just supposed to um, weed out properties that have recently been purchased, properties that are mid mortgage, um, in order to allow the people who are looking to purchase properties or that are looking to facilitate an exchange of a property, uh, make it easier for them to find the right ones among the, the haystack that we've created, right? We've created a haystack. And so we want our, our, to help our users find those needles. Very cool. Those are some cool models. I'm glad I asked. Mm. Um, so what do you look for in people you hire? So if somebody wanted to work with you, if they, if they said to themselves, wow, this sounds awesome, working on knowledge graphs in a VC-backed company that is changing an industry, that is changing commercial real estate, how could, uh, what would somebody have to do to impress you in an interview? We look for people that are keen to learn and keen to grow. And we look for people that have, I do, I do an interview that is a, where I create a scenario and I'm looking for people who are reflective, like they're thinking about, you know, what is the data coming in? How do I evaluate the data 
um, that I've been given before I leap to, you know, what features am I going to create? What models would be appropriate? What, what, given the problem that I've been given, what do I need to require from the training data, et cetera? So we look for things like that. We look for people who can, the data is complex. It's messy. Look for people who kind of have that Sherlock Holmes instinct where they're asking the simple questions and the complicated questions and they're sleuthing. Then lastly, we, we I look for people because, because the AI and ML is so deeply embedded within the pipelines, there has to be a very tight collaboration between the data scientists and the other parts of the engineering org and specifically mm-hmm. between the data scientists and the data engineers. I look for people who can kind of the code that they produce is well organized and structured and that they can communicate what they're doing and why they're doing it to people that might not be as familiar with machine learning and AI. Perfect. So two of those things, keen to learn, like knowing how to learn and communication. Although I also do like the twist of um, writing clean code. Um, that is something that I hadn't thought of in that context before, but that that is another form of communication. So when we think about communication, like I'm thinking about verbal communication, written communication, and I guess code is writing, but it's a different, it requires a different kind of thinking. Um, not only just the comments, which well-commented code, obviously very helpful, but even just literally the way you write the code itself can be either, (laughs) it can be a huge difference, you know, a, a really great engineer. Uh, or data scientist writes code in a way that you can look at it. Maybe it doesn't even need comments because it's so obvious why you broke things up into these functions here and there, and the functions are well-named. Cool. Yeah, oh. absolutely. But <laughs> so those two things, uh, <laughs> knowing how to learn, like being keen to learn and communication, that's what almost everyone says. So I ask this question on most episodes. Um, so when when people are senior data scientists like you who are doing hiring, I ask them that. And it's those two things that always show up so much so that I've actually, I've done a standalone episode on it. So uh, episode 466 is on the difference between a good versus a great data scientist. And I highlighted in that episode that aired in late April that, okay, these are the two things, the two most important things. But I love the extra twist of um, clean, understandable code. And then also you had that nice other piece there, which isn't something that people, I I don't know if I've had anyone say that before, but that kind of idea of being a detective, so Mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Being able to ask easy questions, hard questions. I love that. Um, One of the things that we found that's been really helpful is the, so we use Databricks. It allows um, us to do visualizations in Python and code in PySpark, as well as code in Spark Scala. So you can have all three languages present in one notebook using that platform. Mm. And the reason that I say that it helps with communication is that it means that the data scientists that are working on the pipeline and the data engineers that are working on the pipeline, they can look at the same thing. They can look at the same at the link to the same notebook. So they can, they're literally looking at the same data. And that is, that is instrumental from the engineering side. The, you know, the uh, text editing tool that everybody, um, most people seem to gravitate towards is, is IntelliJ. It doesn't, IntelliJ doesn't allow you to really dig into the data the way that a notebook does. And, so there can be kind of a there's a there's a missing link there. There's a there's a missing space, right? The screen space on IntelliJ is taken up. You're looking at the lines of code. You're not looking at the data that's being produced in the different steps. So when people are looking at different things, the code versus the data, they can have miscommunications. When they're looking at the same thing, you really get some tight knit teams, and you also learn a great deal because the team is so tight knit. So I hired two data scientists about two years ago and they came in only knowing Python and then they learned PySpark and then they started learning Spark Scala 
And then they were deploying their own algorithms in a production pipeline and their title changed to MLE, right? And, and this, this platform helped them do that. Super cool. So, you know, I've heard of Databricks a million times. They are big conference sponsors, for example. Yeah. But I don't think I'd ever had it explained to me what, what it is. So let me try to explain back what I understood and you can tell me where I'm wrong. So it's kind of like a Jupyter notebook mm -hmm. in that I guess you can kind of share with your teammates like a URL and everybody can go to that URL and kind of look at the same notebook. But so a Jupyter notebook, so Jupyter, uh, it came out of the IPython project. So it's supposed to be this kind of interactive Python um, ID, I guess, where you can have code and graphics output, but then it developed to Jupyter, which is Julia, Python, and R mixed yeah. together into one word. So these kind of three data science languages. Um, but I think even then, I don't think you can do, I don't think you can mix and match in the same notebook. Um, yeah. but, you, but anyway, but you can use those three languages in Jupyter. Mm -hmm. Now, so what you're saying with Databricks is it has at least some of that core functionality of being able to write code in, being able to see tables of output, being able to see plots of output, but you can mix and match many different languages into the right. one notebook. Um, now, does that mean, is that kind of, so if I don't know, okay, so PySpark, okay, maybe I might be able to figure out because I know Python, but Spark Scala to me would probably uh, be a completely foreign language. Mm -hmm. Is it, how would I understand someone's like Spark Scala code? In, in Databricks. Yeah. So, so Spark Scala is particularly interesting. Scala is the native language and then PySpark is actually layered on top. Spark Scala. And, uh, sorry, uh, PySpark. PySpark oh, layered oh, on oh, top. Oh, oh. Right? On top of and Python? On top, no. On top of Scala. Yeah. So, oh. so the syntax is different, um, but it's similar. There are different ways to um, define the typing, and that's where a lot of the syntax changes come in. Some of the ways that you can you write out the code, they do look very similar. What Scala gives you as an added benefit is that because Scala is native, you don't need to use the kind of API layer for it. So you can write code that looks like little Python functions within the jobs that you're running. And so either way you slice it, it's Scala is still a functional programming language. There's still, um, there's still that functional structure to, as a hurdle to go from Python to Scala. Mm -hmm. But the, when you look at the code and the kind of micro components of the code, the smallest components of the code, they are more translatable than you would necessarily assume at first glance. Nice. And so I'm just going to try to repeat some of that back to you again. Uh, so key distinction, which will be, some people will know this, some, some listeners will know this, but some won't. So Python is an object-oriented programming language, mm -hmm. um, which actually R is as well, which a lot of listeners would be familiar with. So you're kind of, you're focused on kind of like the nouns of software. So you're focused on the object. So the, you know, the, the thing that actually has data and then you can add methods to it so that you can have kind of the methods are like the verbs that you apply to these noun objects. Now Scala as a functional programming language is, as a functional programming language, you're focused on the verb. That's kind of like the primary like the functions that are doing things are the focus and objects kind of flow through them. So, so yeah, I guess that's, I never thought about it that way, but there's kind of this nice noun verb difference between object oriented and functional programming languages. Yeah. I like that perspective. That's a fun way to put it. Yeah. That's, that's a fresh one. Um, so, so, so it's going to be tricky. So like for me, I've never worked, I haven't worked much with functional programming languages looking at Scala would be kind of tricky, but what you're saying is because, um, because PySpark is actually written in Scala. Yeah. Yeah. The, there's yeah. ends up being a lot of overlap in like how things work. And so you can kind of flow from one to the other, 
people can start to piece things together. And like you're saying, you could have someone come in, who I can't remember now the direction that they flowed in, but it was like Python, Python to PySpark. To PySpark, to yeah. Spark Scholar, yeah. 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 Cool. All right. So basically what you're telling me is in this Databricks notebook, I would be looking at code in Spark Scala, but if I'm already familiar with PySpark, I can probably piece together largely what's happening. Maybe it's helped by the well the well commented code by these great commenters that you've hired. And then um, you know, the kind of graphs and data outputs I'd be able to understand anyway. And then I think that's kind of the key piece here is that you can have all of the all of the data, then you're working from the same thing. You're all seeing the same version of things as opposed to I think it's something that happens a lot is you'll you'll do prototyping in one kind of space. So like, and this, you know, we do this in my company, I think a lot of companies do this, where we prototype with kind of one set, one stack of tools, and then we engineer with another stack of tools. Right. And so it ends up being every time we're translating some machine learning model from the data science team that's prototyping it to the engineering team, we have people who have to <laughs> make sure that yeah. that's, they have to do it really carefully to make sure that everything is translated faithfully into that new um, stack of software. Right. Yes. So, you, you know, we, we even, so in, um, because of the nature of, of PySpark and Spark Scala, you can train, you can re write code in PySpark and you can train a model and then you can port that trained model to a Spark Scala pipeline as well, right? Of course, you would have to rewrite features and make sure that the inputs going to the models are, it's the same, but you don't necessarily need to rewrite all of the code that's doing the training. Nice. It's also a nice functionality. And then, and then also Databricks, it lives on top of, clusters. So that's one other difference I think that we haven't touched on Ooh. particular notebook. So you can provision a cluster of whatever size you need of, uh, I mean, lots of different types. It, it could be GPU as opposed to CPU. It, it could be, it could be what you need, but that allows you to play with the kind of play with the cluster before you are trying to run something in production. So you can look at scalability before you get to the point that you're trying to, to to put it in and run it across everything. So, you know, the data scientists can can run the models across everything and they can look at the outputs and create the distributions and do all that. There's a kind of that extra layer of independence there. Yeah, it is it is possible with Jupyter notebooks to run multiple servers uh, and mm -hmm. distribute the compute, but it tends to be messy. <laughs> it's something that like I rarely do myself. <laughs> it's a task that I delegate um, because I'm like, oh, man, that's going to be tough. Something always, I seem to always do something wrong. I'm like, why is all my memory being used up on all these machines? I thought I ended it, thought yeah. the job was over, but <laughs> it isn't somehow. Anyway, so I could imagine how to like Databricks, um, they've kind of figured out how to do that uh, in a way that is uh, easier. Yes. Yeah. They, they've made it really easy. Cool. Well, good to know. I've, yeah, I've learned a bunch on this podcast already, but Databricks, that's, yeah, it's something that I hear about a lot and I'm so glad to actually understand what it is now. All right. So we've talked about Maureen, what you look for in people that you hire and that led us to that brilliant Databricks discussion. So my understanding is that you are actually doing hiring right now. So you're hiring a data scientist, data analyst, data engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about those roles. What I guess it could even be useful for some people to understand what the distinction is between a data scientist, a data analyst, and a data engineer. And then, yeah, let us know. Tell us about those jobs and where people can apply. Sure. Yeah. Rionomy has a lot of open roles right now. Um, on our careers page, you can see that there are just a ton of open roles. The data scientists, they do the work that we've been describing, where, where we're looking for people who can build models to support product functionality. So we're continuing to work on and improve the person resolution within our pipeline. We're looking to improve the the company tree structures um, that we've created where 
um, doing, because we've created these big company tree structures, we now have the problem of organizing the people that fall under the tree in order to provide, you know, who is the best person to talk to? Is it a property manager? Is it somebody from a local branch? Is it, you know, you don't want to recommend the CEO of Pepsi just because down at the bottom of the corporate tree, there are uh, commercial properties um, that are attached to that tree. So we, we create problems for ourselves as we right. successfully build things. So there's, there's always more. We've got a lot going on right now. So that, that's what the data scientists do. And if you can deploy your models in our production environment, we're happy to call you an MLE as well. Machine learning engineer. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, so the, as well, so data scientist slash machine learning engineer. Or, or, <laughs> or, or well, I meant the uh, I meant one or yeah. the other, but pick yeah. one. Come yeah. on, pick one. <laughs> so if you want to go um, deeper into the algorithms and uh, manipulating the model and and manipulating the information that goes into the models, you know you can continue to pr progress up the data science career track trajectory. Or if you are interested more in production deployments and optimizing how quickly things run, the cluster configuration, um, as well as doing development of models, you know, that's a different route to go up. The data analyst position is about pulling data from different parts of our pipeline in order to evaluate opportunities. We're building so many things. We have to be careful of the things that we choose and we'll come up with ideas but it actually takes a significant amount of work and there's information nuance in understanding what the opportunity actually is, what the lift actually would be for the data analyst role. Like that is one of the major components of that. And it's exciting because you're, you're in a lot of ways defining the direction of the product, which I don't, you know, that's a, that's, there's, that's kind of unique. <laughs> that's yeah. That's, that's unique. for a data analyst role. That's huge for being able yeah. to actually define where things go. So, you, so the data analysts would still be doing a lot of that detective work, um, looking mm -hmm. for unusual things or opportunities across all of the data that you have, things that could potentially be in the product, things that a data scientist could model, and then maybe so I so kind of a way that I often like a rule of thumb a way that I distinguish the kind of idea of a data analyst from a data scientist is they're really similar jobs, except a data scientist would more often be building a model and yeah. validating a model. Yeah. Um, and I think often people grow from the data analyst role into a data science role because mm -hmm. in that kind of situation you're describing, you're like, people are seeing, seeing the data, they see all kinds of opportunities, they can put it in a table or a plot and see, I think there's a relationship here and it kind of lends itself automatically and you're like, you start experimenting with a little regression model and all of a sudden you've got a taste and you're building models. Yeah. Yeah. And I am I'm, I'm open to different career pro progressions, right? So if we hire an analyst that wants to continue to be an analyst, mm -hmm. that's great. If we sure. hire someone that wants to transition over to the DS career track, that's that's great too. Another way that I think about, I like the way that you put it, but another way that I, that I think about it is that the analysts do work that does not become a permanent part of the product. It might drive the product forward. Um, it might um, reflect cool. on how well we've done for the product, but it doesn't live as part of the product. Whereas the things that the data scientists are doing, the data scientists also do data munching and they're not always doing models, although we have a we have a lot um, for the size team that we have. Um, so that's a that's a kind of another way that I think about the, the difference there. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that makes perfect sense to me. And I think that that kind of definition is, um, is common across a lot of data analyst roles. Mm -hmm. So thank you for bringing that up. So when you were talking about a machine learning engineer, so we talked about three different kinds of roles. We talked about data scientists, data analysts. We also talked about that you're hiring data engineers so in the way that you define it, is that something different from a machine learning engineer? Yeah, the MLEs are focused really on the models, those components that fit within the pipeline. But there's a whole realm of work that needs to be done in order to support both the ingestion, the information that we're ingesting from our different sources, the 
property sources, the company sources, um, we use shape data, and then we have additional person information sources that I mentioned before. And then there are a great deal of transformations that need to be happen need to happen to that data. There's kind of source specific information that we take out. There is data standardization and some cleaning that's done at the top of the pipeline rather than just before the models. There is creation of, I mean, essentially like getting the data out of the graph and into the API, um, into our Elasticsearch cluster to support the search functionality in the app. All of that um, falls under the realm of data engineering. It's pretty much everything that's not the, the models. Nice. That makes perfect sense. And, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way before, but it, it, it basically, basically, yeah, it's a machine learning engineer is concerned with deploying the model. There's still tons of other pipelines in a lot of applications. And so the data engineer is concerned with those pipelines that don't necessarily have a model integrated in them. Yeah, yes. We have a really excellent data engineering team. You can find our, our director of data engineering, James, on LinkedIn as well. Um, he and I are connected. And so if you want to look us both up after the podcast, please feel free to do so. And just, just mention, you can uh, connect with me and mention the super data science podcast that I know uh, where you're coming from. Awesome. Yeah. And um, so... We've talked about growing a data science team. That's something that you've actually developed some real expertise in. You've scaled a lot of data science teams. Um, you've done talks on growing data science teams. You have kind of like a few takeaway tips for people when they're doing it themselves. Sure. I think that it's uh, critical to really start with a good understanding of not just what's needed within the company, but also what the expectations are of the other players within the company. So that could be a direct manager. It could be the, the C-suite, your executive team. That could be other parts of the company um, that could, you know, if product falls outside of your structure, which sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, but kind of understanding the expectations there can help you identify the communication patterns that are needed. You know, some some organizations read need really frequent communication for them to have confidence in this very large investment that they've placed in your care. Um, it's it's high reward, but it's also very high risk for any company. Being proactive about addressing the expectations and the needs and building and scaling your team so that with that in mind, I mean not based uh, not focused on that, but kind of keeping that in the periphery, I think is, is really helpful. Making sure that the, the communication processes um, and the technical processes with the other parts of the company are also very important. Usually when you're in a smaller company, there isn't anybody that will, that will tell you what's needed, right? And um, because I've seen so many different architectures and I've seen so many different products at this point, I kind of have a feel for, oh, well, we need some monitoring systems in place. We need to get Databricks because of the languages that we have. We need to organize cross-functional teams where these people are working together. Um, if, if I wasn't working at Reonomy, if I was working someplace else and we had a, a big data lake and and the models could operate off of the data lake instead of um, within these high volume pipelines that are so tightly coupled with the work that the engineers are doing, I might have a completely different team structure. I might say, okay, our team is just going to be a data science team or multiple data science teams focused on different products. And we're going to operate from on the database and will put in place some infrastructure to do that and keep us separate from the engineering pipelines that are um, kind of ingesting information and populating the database. So I think that what I'm really arguing for is talking to all of the people that you work with before you start, before you have any preconceived ideas about how to build your team in order to get this holistic view 
of all of the different types of interactions that are needed in order to have a successful product. Cool. Does that kind of address what you were talking about or is that yeah. kind of too high level? Or No, that's great. I think that's perfect. Um, especially because there's at least one other thing that I want to talk to you about and I don't want to have to take your, the entirety of your day. For the people at home listening, I am dragging on this interview well beyond the, uh, the time that we've scheduled today. Oh, so we had a lot of fun catching up. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't regret time spent at all <laughs> in any way. <laughs> you, but anyway, I have, so I still have, I have one other kind of big topic before we start wrapping things down, which is, um, you transitioned from an academic career into industry. So you did a PhD at Columbia, uh, in computational astrophysics which sounds awesome. And you're welcome to tell us a little bit about that if you'd like to. But the piece that I want to focus on is you then, you continued on in academia. So you did a postdoc at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And then you took the Insight Data Science Program, which I think I know a little bit about, and you can tell me where I'm wrong about this. But so there are a lot of data science boot camps out there. And um, most of them, especially if it's like a full-time in-classroom boot camp, they will charge you to, to participate. But the way that this Insight program worked is they turned things the other way around, is they said, well, what if we found people that are really exceptional, really exceptional academics, for example? And I think for a while, they only took people with PhDs. That's right. And so they find amazing people and they say, we will train you to be industry-based data scientists for free. Um, but like, you know, you have to talk, at least talk to these potential companies that would be interested in hiring you. And then they take their fee from the hiring company. Um, so I might've got that right. Yeah, that is right. So it's, it's like, um, it's like a recruiter fee that comes from the company that's hiring you. Yeah. Um, cool. So how, I mean, I guess, tell us a bit about the transition from academia to industry, like why you chose to do that. Um, and then maybe specifically like that kind of program that Insight can offer um, or other kinds of programs that people might be able to consider if you have some insights into that. <laughs> but I'm fun. Oh, um, God, that's a bad one. So bad. So, uh, yeah, so I, um, I very much enjoyed being in academia. I was very lucky with some of the choices that I made as an academic. I was working in high volume data pipelines. I was mm -hmm. running, writing code and running code on supercomputers. And back when they were called supercomputers and there were still very few of them within the United States. And I would have simulations that would run for a month on a supercomputer. It was, it was, it was, um, very large volumes of code and how much uh, data can there be in the universe? I mean, come I on. know. Right? <laughs> um, so, so from to, to give you an example of the, you know, why we needed supercomputers. So I was looking at the evolution of galaxies. The easiest way to do it <laughs> is to take the, a map of the primordial fluxion, uh, fluctuations that, um, that microwave background that you might be familiar with from some of the media, like for, for a while you could buy a, a beach ball and instead of like the color stripes on it, it had the microwave background. <laughs> that was a favorite uh, around the office. Um, you take the, the primordial fluctuations of the universe and then you evolve them forward and the colder areas become denser and then they start to form galactic structures. They form groups of galaxies and that's the easiest way to do it because when you, it's very hard to create a balanced galaxy. So if I wanted to create a, a simulation of the Milky Way, the way that it looks today, it would be very hard to get it to be stable. Usually the galaxy starts shrinking on you a little bit. It starts oh. expanding because they're so delicately balanced. So you oh. evolve from primordial fluctuations, which means that you get these giant structures and then you have to run an additional simulation that's like a zoomed in version if you only want to look at a single galaxy. So you can get resolution differences of 16 orders of magnitude if you're talking about going from 
these large groups of where there are thousands of galaxies in a group down to a kind of almost at stellar resolution objects that create the right shape galaxies. Wow. Um, so, and, uh, so that was just, uh, man, and an absolute ton of fun. It taught me things that I didn't know that I was learning, like how to be, um, strategic with the way that I did my research and goal oriented with the way that I did research and to be very tactical with the compute resources and trying to run things, not just so that they're robust and there are no bugs, but so that they run more quickly because <laughs> I don't want to wait 12 hours every time I have to do an analysis right. um, on, on the outputs from these large simulations. Um, so there was, there was a um, just kind of innately some things that I needed to learn as part of my PhD. And then I got into industry and it was like, well, <laughs> This is great. I already learned a lot of the things that I need to know. Um, but as for the as for the why, I think that there's a, a trend in academia for that people are leaving. Part of the reason that they're leaving is because you can do fun, amazing things outside of academia with a similar skill set now. Companies are doing a lot of really fascinating research you're building things that have never been built before right we've never had ownership structures for all commercial properties across the u.s before mm -hmm. but but also um the united states kind of went through a, a boom in the growth of academic institutions in the 70s and 80s and then we leveled off and then we started to shrink a little bit so there are less positions that are available which means that there's a pretty high likelihood that you it's small you you you've entered into a, a small number statistics game, and most of the people that go in will do many many postdocs and the tenured positions well the associate faculty positions in a lot of cases aren't necessarily what they used to be. Um, you can be a lecturer at a top university and still not have healthcare. It's pretty staggering how much what the lifestyle looks like now and how much it's changed from, you know, 40 years ago. Yeah. A lot of people are leaving and I, and I was part of that. I have been part of that. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, and I saw the same thing coming out of my PhD where it looked like a absolutely astronomical amount of work. And I wasn't even working in astrophysics. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That, 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 <laughs> Um, but, uh, so but only had... two in the whole podcast, <laughs> you're dropping the ball. Uh, uh, um, so I completely understand that where you, where you're looking ahead at so much uncertainty where you're kind of, you're applying for grants, this constant, constant, constant application for grants that often only last for a couple of years. And so even the uncertainty around where you'll live, because right. Okay, you get a grant at one place, you get a grant in the UK for two years and then, and then what, okay, you got a grant in the U S and then, wow, I got a grant in Singapore, you know, like you can end up, you kind of have to follow where the grants come in. And so through those postdoc years, you're jumping around from place to place. You're doing, yeah, huge amounts of work. And the ultimate goal, like you said, for a lot of people is to get that associate professorship beyond a tenure track. And those opportunities are, are, rare. There are very few positions. People hold them for their lifetime. And yeah, so I don't know. I completely understand. And like you say, and I think it's happening more and more and more. One of the really exciting things about the data science field is it is expanding. It's still expanding rapidly. And if you want a lot on that, uh, in episode 471 with Kirill Aramenko, we talk a ton about how not only has data science been this growing industry for the last few years, and so some people are like, has it peaked? Absolutely not. It is still growing a lot. And in a lot of companies, you can be doing super interesting work like you do. So, and you can end up having tons of resources, uh, be able to hire lots of great people and feel like you have the job security, the healthcare, all that stuff. So completely understand. Um, anyway, I guess, would you recommend people do a boot camp like you did, or um, was that was that valuable? 
Um, what was valuable about Insight was that I think one of the most valuable things that I didn't realize at the time uh, is that it created kind of an instant network for me. Um, yeah. the people who I was going through the boot camp with, they're all still in the industry. A lot of them are still in the area and we rely on each other still. We ask mm. each other questions. How are you dealing with this? What do you do with this? You know, do you think that I should um, go for an MLE title? Do you think that I should take this opportunity or that opportunity? Right. How did you grow your team? Oh. What things were difficult? So. I'm so, so jealous you? as you say that. It's so <laughs> obvious. I wish I had that. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So so realizing that and building those relationships up and staying staying in touch with those people has has been just wonderful. It's just been wonderful. You definitely you want to treat people as your friends and not as competitors. You know, even though we are all looking for jobs at the same time, they're not they are not competitors. They've they've been good friends. Um, yeah. 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 Um, You're not fighting over a few faculty jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are, there's just, there are so many things to do. There's, there's no reason to, there's no reason to have anything but friendships. And then I think the other things that were really helpful was that, you know, I had no idea how to interview for right. a technical position the way that engineers interview yeah. have, been have you seen about. how long my cv is i'm a shoe in <laughs> for this role <laughs> yeah right um so yeah academic interviews are you know what they're like they're tell me about your thesis tell me about your last you know publication for one hour or three hours or right. four hours or <laughs> whatever and that's the interview that's it. it it's not like coding questions and you know, talent, uh, culture questions and all of this different type of stuff. So an introduction to this different world was, was, was also very valuable. Cool. Um, all right. Well, we've covered all my big topics. I've just got my little questions left now. And so the first one is, do you have a book recommendation for us, Maureen? Oh, I, I do. Um, I actually have, I t pulled two books out of my bookcase one I've read recently, and it's called Other Minds. Yeah. And so that's the second recommendation that we've had. So Deblina Bhattacharji, who was back on episode 439 that aired at the end of January, she also recommended Other Minds, and I have been dying to read it. So I'm so glad that you brought it up again. Tell us about it. It is, man, I am just in love with this book. It is talks about how the octopus and its environment and its anatomy has driven different structures within its brain and a different way of perceiving the world. And it makes you, it creates this sense of wonder and it makes you feel like you know, well, well, if you're interested in aliens, they're here, they're here on our, on our planet and we can interact right. with them and try to understand them. And, you know, they have a, it's, I mean, I just, I can't say enough good things about this book. I absolutely love it. And it's, it's very thorough and it has, I'm opening the back cover now. And, and this is, this is all of the notes. Um, there's just pages and pages and pages of, of uh, notes of references to pieces of research. And so it's, but it's not like dry and technical. It's there's it's a little magical. Sounds perfect. That sounds like a really talented author. I look forward to not only reading that, but seeing what else they've done because that sounds like a really special talent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. And I believe you have one other book recommendation for us, uh, as if that wasn't enough. Yeah. So the other one is uh, called Presentation Zen. Cool. Um, and it is that one's about, about meditation. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, well, it's about how to create visuals that go with the stories that you're telling when you are, you know, creating a PowerPoint or whether you're creating some kind of architectural diagram or whether you are 
um, have whether you have some kind of internal collaboration on your team and that where you're trying to figure things out and solve problems. And the reason that it's called presentation Zen is because it emphasizes simplicity. It kind of presents you with the idea that clarity uh, comes through simplicity and it just does an excellent job of that. I, I picked this book up when I was still doing my PhD and it helped me hugely. Cool. I, I think that that's a really great pragmatic recommendation. I love that you have these two different book recommendations and they're so different. So one is like not obviously applied to data science, though I'm sure you know yeah, anything can inspire ideas, but it just sounds absolutely fascinating. Other minds and then presentations end is just this quite pragmatic suggestion for data scientists to become better communicators, particular, particularly in presentations. So this has been such an amazing episode, Maureen. I hope that we can have you on the show again sometime. Um, I want to quickly mention there was something that we talked about a lot in the beginning, which was the deep learning study group that you and I met at. Mm -hmm. And so if people are interested in hearing about that, I probably should have mentioned it at the time, but didn't think of it. You can check it out. You can head to deeplearningstudygroup.org to see I have um, separate Jupyter notebooks for each one of the sessions that we had. And um, so there's lots of cool information there. If you're getting started in deep learning, it was kind of, you can see what the kind of path that we followed as we learned about deep learning. Um, although I did kind of, I did bring that all together into my book, Deep Learning Illustrated. So that might even be a better resource, but anyway, check it out. There's really cool photos, lots of amazing people doing incredible presentations. Um, so I wanted to mention that as something you could check out. I don't think I've mentioned the deep learning study group on the show before, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is how you've, I guess you've already mentioned, so I was going to say, how should people stay in touch with you? You already mentioned that, but I guess I want to bring that up to, again now. Mm -hmm. uh, typically we do it at the end of the show. So you already mentioned LinkedIn is the place to find you. We'll of course include the specific URL in the show notes. And yeah, people should add you, but when they add you, they should mention that you, that they were listening to the super data science podcast. And I often give that recommendation in the conclusion to the episode that, that I record separately from this and will, will happen for listeners in a minute. But uh, I'm, yeah, that's what I say too, is I'm like, please add me on LinkedIn. But if you mentioned that it was because you were listening to the super data science show, then I'll know that you weren't a random recruiter or salesperson. Right. Um, so. Yeah. Well, this has been so much fun. I've really enjoyed myself. Um, and I, you're just a, absolutely fantastic person to do these kinds of things with. So I'm so Thanks. appreciative of the opportunity to do it. Thank you so much. The feeling is mutual, Maureen. All right. We'll catch you again soon. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, yeah. Wow. Maureen is equally brilliant, whether we're talking about deep technical topics or practical commercial considerations. In this episode, we learned about knowledge graphs, which are a graph data structure that allows for different types of data at the graphs nodes, such as company nodes, people nodes, and property nodes. We talked about tools and techniques for high volume data pipelines and data science teams that scale well, including Spark Scala ML pipelines, PySpark, IntelliJ, and Databricks. We talked about what Maureen looks for in the people she hires, things like being keen to learn, having clear, understandable communication skills, and uh, being detectives that ask both easy questions and hard questions. And we talked about the differences between data analysts and data scientists, as well as the differences between machine learning engineers and data engineers. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, any materials mentioned on the show, and the URL for Maureen's LinkedIn profile, as well as my own social media profiles, at superdatascience.com slash 479. That's superdatascience.com slash 479. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd of course greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app. To let me know your thoughts on the episode, please do feel welcome to add me on LinkedIn or on Twitter, and then tag me in a post to let me know your thoughts on this episode. Your feedback is invaluable for figuring out what topics we should cover next. Since this is a free podcast, if you're looking for a free way to help me out, I'd be very grateful if you left a review of my book, Deep Learning Illustrated on Amazon or Goodreads. You gave some videos on my YouTube channel a thumbs up or subscribe to my free content-rich newsletter on johncrone.com. 
to support the super data science company that kindly funds the management, editing, and production of this podcast without any annoying third-party ads, you could create a free login to their learning platform at superdatascience.com, or consider buying a usually pretty darn cheap Udemy course published by Ligency, a super data science affiliate, such as my Mathematical Foundations of Machine Learning course. All right, thanks to Ivana, Aima, Mario, and JP on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another amazing episode today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon. Thank you.